And uh, you've also studied uh, Gardnerian craft? Um, I, while I was practicing Narugd and working in a coven, I made contact with a Gardnerian priestess and studied with her. And I just found that the two things fed different needs. I mean, I really love the beauty of Narugd and I love the, the public ceremonies. There's really something about uh, being a priest for a community of people. Mm -hmm which, at least in our, our mythology, is something that was in the old days. You know, we were doing this for the communities. Uh, you know, uh, But there's a real special feel to that, and also a special feel to the, uh, the drama of that. Mm -hmm. you know, because when you're doing public ritual, you are creating a dramatic reenactment of the seasons. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that really appeals. Gardnerian craft, on the other hand, was created in secrecy. It was created, modern Gardnerian craft was created at a time when people were, you know, behind blackout curtains, you know, so you, you, everything was very much in secret. So there's no, no such thing as a big public ritual; it doesn't exist. Um, but also, it has a very significant history, not just a modern history going back to Gardner, um, but I believe an earlier history going back through the people that that taught him, that he trained with, going back into uh, the 19th century. Um, but also a history that I believe goes back much further. And part of me coming out of religious studies and anthropology loved being able to, to wrestle with text. Mm. Uh, not scripture, not something that, that you had to agree with or said you had to do this, that, or the other thing, but just text mm. uh, that told you how earlier people interpreted what you were doing. And I think that there's a real richness to be found in understanding how, how different people before you in different circumstances related to the same material. Uh, it opens up layers of meaning. And that really wasn't possible in the root, partly because it was so new and partly because there just wasn't as much interest in mm -hmm. text and preserving a textual tra tradition. So they're two very different things. And it also sounds kind of like the way that Narug formed and the source that you were using it was already common knowledge that it was going to be public. It was going to be shared publicly. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a, a desire to kind of keep it secret. It was stuff that you would want, mm -hmm. that people would probably be familiar with anyhow. Well, yeah, I because mean, the, the, the Rune tradition is very much a public mm -hmm. tradition. Most of the material is public, except for the initiations mm -hmm. and some other very core material. But most of it, yeah, people can look at it. It's, it's shareable. Uh, the Gardnerian material, on the other hand, almost all of it is secret. Yeah, right now, almost everything is secret. Um, so, you know, very, very different, uh, and very different, and very different uh, ways or methods of approachability. You know, that because you could go to a public group's habit, you could sort of encounter it and experience it, and and see if you want to get involved. Gardnerian group is very much, since it's so secretive, it's much more complex to get involved. Right. Um, because you really have to know somebody who knows somebody, and then there has to be something that you can come to um, that will usually be in someone's home, you know, in someone's backyard, something much more contained and private. So, and that's something, you know, I always say we're wrestling with this, we're wrestling with that. You know, this is <laughs> a time of change. <laughs> yeah, this is, a time of, this is a time of huge change for yeah. religion in general, mm -hmm. and we're not being left out of that. Uh, in, the, in, in the days of the Internet, where uh, there's a lot of people with the approach, information wants to be free, how does a secret tradition relate to that? Right. And uh, really wrestling with the question of what is secret and why? You know, what needs to be secret and why? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard even for a secretive tradition to have that conversation because it's so hard for people to get together and talk. So that one's going to be a bugaboo for us for a while. I <laughs> and I can imagine, too, that it's probably such a diverse community. Okay. So to get... I guess like um, a group consensus mm -hmm. would be just the task in itself. Just yeah. even just getting who would be in the group. Yeah. What would make you in the group? Yeah. Should you be in the group? Right. I mean, who can speak for other people, if anybody? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I could imagine that that would just be a, just a, ta a monumental task in itself. It just means that change happens very slowly. Yeah. It happens by individual people changing their mind or hearing what somebody else's idea was and going, I like that, I'll do that too. Mm -hmm. you know, but that's, re and then their initiates learning something somewhat differently. But that's a very, very slow kind of change. So I'm sure it will happen. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it's going to take time. And it's also true that in, in a modern world, the more secret you are, the less like you, likely you are to survive. Hmm. Uh, the more secret you are, the more restrictive you are on what, under what conditions material can be passed or to whom it can be passed, the more likely it is to die out. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think there is a tendency that towards a more uh, progressive, maybe, uh, approach towards the craft, towards Gardnerian craft, uh, over time, either that or it dies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, it seems from my from my perspective, um, Gardnerian craft, and I, I always kind of consider Gardnerian and Alexandrian mm -hmm. very similar yeah, together. Yeah. Is it seems like it's come out of the shadows, mm -hmm. and now it's kind of now it's kind of like exposed to this light, mm -hmm. and so now they're kind of like, well, should we go with it, or mm -hmm. should we kind of like try and remain a little hidden. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's probably one of the things that a lot of a lot of individuals wrestle with mm -hmm. who may have not learned I don't know exactly how I'm how I'm describing this, but it does seem like it would be a difficult situation to kind of to wrestle with. Mm -hmm. And well, one uh, of the things that is happening though, mm -hmm. I think, is that uh, there's a phenomenon that whenever something goes from a parent country to the colonies, mm -hmm. uh, the parent country will feel much more like, oh yes, this is our stuff, we own it, and feel much more comfortable with change uh, because it's theirs. The colony typically will feel more guarded, more protected, uh, because they're more aware of a possibility of loss. Mm -hmm. And so they tend to be more strict more, and more, uh, more secretive, that'll happen. So we're, we're experiencing that phenomenon in the United States. Uh, but it's also true that in most movements over time, if they, the harder, more strict they get, they tend to experience a revitalization movement. Mm -hmm. And a revitalization movement is characterized by looking back to earlier days in the tradition. And all these things that, say, in Christianity would have happened over several hundred years, we're getting in like 50. Right. Uh, and so I think we're experiencing a revitalization movement at the same time in Gardnerian craft, where... A number of people who uh, might be, uh, I'm being careful and try to be diplomatic, but might, <laughs> might, be, might be characterized as more progressive, are finding themselves more in agreement with people in the mother country mm. uh, and in other parts of the world, you know, the Gardnerians in other parts of the world. Because pretty much wherever you find English speaking people, you'll find Gardnerians. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's becoming a push for change. Uh, but again, a very, very slow push. It's going to be a long. It's going to be a slow process, and that's to be expected. Yeah. You know. um, and I think with the internet, there's there's, um, I mean, information is just out there, and mm -hmm. I think that a lot of a lot of stuff that would have happened over like like you said, centuries mm -hmm. and even mm -hmm. you know hundreds of years, now can happen mm -hmm. instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, one of the things that I found mm -hmm. is that a lot of the information that is out there is not always accurate or it's mixed in with other right you know other information and so oh i think the gods are looking out for us mm -hmm. i mean because so far everybody who's put out stuff that claims to be you know the secret book of shadows or gardener's book of shadows or whatever it's wrong mm -hmm. you know yes parts of it are right you know but other parts are wrong and uh you know it's really kind of remarkable that it hasn't happened yet uh, so i think somebody's watching over us in some way uh, so what ends up happening is the stuff that's out there uh, becomes interesting material for other people to work with in creating new traditions, mm -hmm. in creating new kinds of craft. Uh, but, you know, that's fine. I think that's fine. Uh, and I think it's something that you learn over time to just not get too upset right. about thinking, oh, they think this is Gardnerian and it's not. It's like, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, it's really not a huge problem. Um, whether something that's been published is or isn't doesn't really make a big difference. You know, because um, the the material that is traditional um, is still being preserved and is still being passed down, and that's what matters. Um, I know I went through a huge sort of change in addressing the material because I was publishing stuff. I was publishing stuff on history of craft and 
on uh, origins of craft and uh, specifically in the Gardnerian context. And I reached a point where I said, you know, I, I'm not going, I will not make a controversial argument in print unless I can back it up. Mm -hmm. I will not say something is true unless I can back it up. And I've now reached a point where things that I would want to say were true, I cannot produce the evidence for. Mm -hmm. No, I, I just, it's just the case. And so I'm stuck. I cannot produce the evidence, so I can't, I'm not going to make the right. statement, so I don't write. So the material that I do now is all four, gar four Gardnerians in a Gardnerian context. I've you know, written a ton of stuff uh, and presented stuff at Gardnerian meetings on our history. Uh, but it's all things for other initiates. Mm -hmm. And I still think because the material can't be published publicly doesn't mean don't do it. It doesn't mean don't do the historical research. Uh, it'll still be valuable for people, be valuable for people in the tradition. And things may change over time. Things may be more public. We don't know. Uh, we certainly wrestle with the fact that uh, what Gardner told us about what the people he worked with thought were secret is very different than what we do now. Uh, so ideas of secrecy change over time. So we'll see what happens. And I'm comfortable with that now. I used to be really kind of bummed out that I really would like to, I'd really like to show that this person is wrong or something. But, right. you know, I'm not going to, it would really be, it would look really bad. It would make you look really bad and say, well, you're wrong, but I can't prove it. You know right, I mean? exactly. Yeah, so. Because then, then you just look like, you know, you're just like being. It, you're it, just complaining. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and I agree. Like, if I, if, that's why I try not to put myself in a position where I will make a claim that I can't support. There's a big difference between being initiated mm -hmm. into a path and then studying a path. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and I think. It's good to put it that way. There is a difference. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people can do immense study on their own. I did. Uh, and people can have experiences with the gods. You know, I did. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, no, nobody, I wasn't in the ritual with somebody else doing it when the goddess spoke to me. You know, and that's what put me on the path. And uh, so clearly that happens. It's not the same thing as a ceremony where other people are doing it for you. And not only are other people doing it for you, which means it's a surprise. You don't know what's going to happen. You didn't write it. You know, you didn't prepare it. But also, it means you're doing it in community. You know, you are now part of that group of people, which of course you can't do on your own. That's clearly different. Uh, what is the path that the person wants to be on? You know, if the person wants to be on a solitary path and they're finding that what they do brings them into, into communion with the gods, great. That's what they should be doing. You know, if someone wants to be on a path where they're put through experiences that they weren't expecting or didn't know what was going to happen for other people, did it to did, did it for them, um, and they want to do it as part of a group, great, that's what they should be doing. Uh, but the key is to find the path that works for you. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is that you shouldn't be feeling that both sides, you know, both of it, people who are initiated shouldn't feel that they're better. People who are not initiated shouldn't feel that the people who are initiated are better. Should just feel that they're different. You know? And uh, I think that's pretty much you know, all there is to it. Uh, I know that, well, I, I can say that in general, people who are in the older initiated traditions have access, typically, to more material that's been passed down. But that's if that's what you want. Mm -hmm. You know? I know, like I said, I, I was Narud and I discovered the Gardnerians and I'm going, oh boy, a bunch of text I can wrestle with. Great. <laughs> There's a bunch of Narud people who have encountered Gardnerians and went, boy, that sounds stuffy and book bound. I don't want to do that. Right. I want to do stuff that comes from the heart. I just slammed into your microphone. <laughs> I want to do stuff that comes from the heart. Uh, so, uh, you know, great. Right. Yeah. I, I just, people shouldn't really put a value judgment on it. Yeah, I think I think I was I think I was uh, putting that value judgment on it because I agree with you. I think it is I think that there one of the lucky things we have with the internet and all the religions in the world is you can you can explore all of them. You can explore a few of them or you can pick you know you can take from various different traditions and kind of, you know, sort of mold your own spiritual life, spirituality. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about our shrinking world. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Well, and I will say this is something that for me, uh, the Gardnerian tradition really does give as a cool thing, which is that everybody who's initiated Gardnerian knows exactly how their initiation line of descent of teachers goes back to mm. Gerald and his teachers, and you know, etc. There is a line of descent that's known. Because of that, if you meet another Gardnerian anywhere in the world, they know their line of descent, and somewhere they're going to overlap, somewhere mm -hmm. they're going to connect. And so there is a sense that a, a way in which that creates family everywhere. And so you can sort of feel like, yeah, you are part of a tribe, you know, and meet other people that are part of it. I was really stunned when I was attending a bembe, which is a, a Yoruban ceremony in San Francisco. Oh, okay. And there was a guest uh, who was an Ifa priest from Nigeria who was literally just off the boat. I mean, mm -hmm. like, had gotten off the boat that morning, you know, <laughs> coming into the United States. Wow. And uh, he was introduced to me, and they said, oh, Don's a Gardnerian priest. And he said, really? So am I. I'm like, what? You know, and we sort of took, I took him aside into another room, and we sort of exchanged some information and determined, yes, this guy is a Gardnerian priest. And he was in a coven in Lagos that had been founded by Gerald when he was traveling in Africa. Oh, wow. You know, years and years and years ago. And, of course, their stuff was in, you know, Nigerian language, and so, of course, there, there were changes, which I would expect. Uh, but it was really fascinating to meet someone, oh, here's another member of the tribe, you know, another member of the family from such a distant place. Uh, and I also had the experience that right after a Pantheacon here, there was Philip Heselton was a guest here from England, and a woman named Deonis, who was the priestess of Gerald's Coven after Doreen left. So, and now I believe she's this, the senior living priestess. She was initiated in 1956. And she was, she and Philip were at my house for full moon right after Pantheacon. And it was really cool to be in a circle. And Philip, you know, as a guest, called the quarters and did them in the way we all know. And Deonis, who had said, oh, no, no, it's been too long. You know, I really don't want to do a part. I'll just, I'll just be in the circle. And I'm standing next to her and I hear her mouthing the circle mm -hmm. words. You know, as we're going. And so, like, here's someone from the other side of the world, and here's someone from 50 years ago. You know, it's like this sort of really interesting connection in time and space. And so, that sense of how the craft is everywhere, and that sense of how the craft really does have time to it, uh, was something that that connection provided. And that was very cool. And that is something that only that kind of connection can provide. Hmm. Um, but, you know, you don't have to have that. <laughs> I just it's thought, nice, but you don't I, I just have thought it was cool. Yeah, I just thought it was cool. I think so, it's really fascinating yeah. that uh, that we have Gardnerian texts that's in Nigeria. Well, that's, and <laughs> I, I love that's it. When, when people are concerned about, is, are you, is your text correct? Or, you know, are you doing it the right way? We do have Gardnerians in parts of the world that don't speak English. And mm -hmm. I know they're not learning to mouth English. They're translating into their own languages. Right. Uh, I know someone who... Uh, encountered a, a coven on an oil rig off India, hmm. off the coast of India. Um, so, I mean, it's changing. You can't avoid that. Anytime you do translation, there's change. Mm -hmm. you, know, you just can't right. avoid it. Um, so, change is in there. It's just we have to sort of gradually acknowledge it and get used to it. Hmm. Now, I have to say, I did not see this guy's Book of Shadows. I would love to see his Book of Shadows. Yeah, because yeah. uh, I wonder what I don't, I don't know anything about Nigerian culture, but I assume they, they probably use English characters. If it's still written, yeah, if it's written in English characters, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. But I would love to just see what they've done. Yeah, I didn't get the chance. I was at a Bembe. We were talking, you know. Right, so. exactly. Yeah, and he so. probably doesn't carry his book. Of Genesis, right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. But that so, is that is fascinating. Yeah. We want to have every subject that a pagan would be interested in studying as part of their paganism. And also material that anybody who was studying the pagan movement would be interested in 